Good afternoon and welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillow, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School of Washington University in St. Louis. So happy to have you with us as part of today's program. Um, for our participants on Zoom, you are muted. We can't see or hear you, but we love for you to participate in this conversation. Um, so please do use the chat feature to post your questions, your comments, and your reactions as today's presentation goes on. I want to acknowledge and thank my, my friend and colleague, Cynthia Williams, who's the Brown School's Assistant Dean for Community Partnerships. She's going to be in the, the chat, um, helping to respond to you, and then also bringing you into the conversation as we move to the Q&A uh, portion of the program. So it's a new year for Open Classroom 2021. Um, we do have our weekly programs published online through at least the third week of February, and there are some that are, are later that are out there as well. But what you're gonna see us focusing on first is Black History Month, um, and this is the lead off event. So as you're likely aware, Black History Month is the annual national observance recognizing the central role and significant contributions that African-Americans have made in our nation's history, life, and culture. It's also known as African-American History Month. And the event was the brainchild of historian Carter G. Woodson. So ever since 1976, every U.S. president has officially designated the month of February as Black History Month. We're just overachievers getting started in mid-January because we've got a lot to say. Um, many wonderful programs headed your way, including a week from today, Tuesday, January the 19th, Assistant Vice Chancellor Nicole Hudson here at Washington University is going to be with us um, for a talk on finding our place in the change. So you'll see we've got wonderful new um, open classroom backgrounds specific to Black History Month. And Cynthia is going to be sharing information in the chat. There, this is really an intentional um, we're very happy with a uh, graphic design that includes um, elements that are symbolic and important. So for today's program, uh, it is my great pleasure to get to introduce my colleague, Dr. Sean Joe, who is the Benjamin E. Youngdahl Professor of Social Development at the Brown School. He's a nationally recognized authority on suicidal behavior among Black Americans, and he's expanding the evidence base for effective practice, particularly with Black boys and young men. Here at the Brown School, he launched the Race and Opportunity Lab, which works to reduce inequality in adolescents as they transition into adulthood. The lab leads Homegrown St. Louis, and that's a capacity building initiative to enhance upward mobility opportunities um, and the health of Black males aged 12 to 29 here in St. Louis. So here to challenge us, are we all racist, self-oppression, and the language of progressive change? Please welcome Dr. Shanja. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. Uh, can you guys hear me? Uh, wonderful invitation. Um, I think I have to just handle the technical issues real quickly. So let me make sure I'm doing that. I think I have the option to share. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for uh, making it this way with us this afternoon. I'm hoping that we're going to engage in a conversation um, that I think the times call for. We've all had a very challenging 2020, and we began this year with a storm in 2021. Again, calling for this moment, this moment that we should think about how are we gonna move ahead and do things differently than we did before? I think we've all been awakened with the pandemic to say that how we've treated each other, how we refer to each other, how we have engaged with each other must be very different if our democracy is to survive, and just even think about our own personal triumph to create space for change and transformation um, and just how we appreciate life. So I'm hoping that I can bring to you a conversation that I've been having with my lab for uh, quite some time. And um, let me, before I get fully into my conversation, let me start this again, um, that, that I've had with my lab for quite some time. And um, to begin to share that here with you as a work in progress that, again, hopefully will stimulate some dialogue and some talk, and we'll be able to uh, uh, have a, a rich conversation uh, for 15 minutes. So let me go forward and put this in context. The Race and Opportunity Lab examines this concept of race and how it interacts with opportunity to advance the social mobility, um, particularly for black males, but with an emphasis of trying to say, how do you take this out of science and it inform policies and interventions and then into professional practice. So our lab is centered on this idea of interrogating the idea of race and its connection to opportunity because we think that's critically important. 
But one of the many things that we do is that we spend time uh, really interrogating what do we mean by race? What is race, its history, its function in our society? And I've had these conversations both in text but also with colleagues over the years since I've been here in St. Louis. And I just thought it was critically important that um, I accepted this wonderful invitation from my colleague, uh, Ms. Williams, and it's rooted in, in this idea of Black History Month. And I said, how wonderful that they, they have so much content that they know they can't fit it into a month. So we're starting here in January. And um, with that, I'm hoping that we can uh, uh, bring you into a dialogue that I've been having with students and some faculty and colleagues over the years. And we've been reading many, many books on this topic and having rich conversations on this topic. Um, we continue to do that and uh, we just finished up CAST in the fall and we're moving into new books in the spring. But uh, I wanna bring you into this conversation framed around, are we all racist? And I, I thought about that as, I, as the year concluded in 2020, thinking about the idea of how self-oppression is something that many are familiar with. You've been trained on the issues of self-oppression. And I constantly hear, as I was listening to the dialogue and, and around progress, uh, progressive thought, transformative thought, uh, transformation, that I kept hearing something that was really uh, kind of uh, uh, grating against my soul every time. Because again, like many, I was in a practice of, of engaging in, in much more racist language and i was trying to figure out how do i how do i encourage others to get out of it because i do think it has meaning dr joe excuse the interruption would you please can you see if you can boost your volume up a little i can i can just basically speak in is this better yes thank you sir okay so i lean back because you know when you're at home you tend to lean back and thinking that everybody gets you so i appreciate that so today's conversation is a person ref reflect a personal observation of examining how self-oppression and systemic uh, racism and intergenerational dehumanization happens through the use of words. And in particularly today, we will center on the word race. So considering how race and concept like ethnicity and caste have been used to describe human diversity, how do we describe the richness, the tapestry that is mankind and in, in many ways has an impact in how we treat each other. So I'm gonna to encourage today my takeaways that I'm hoping I will con continue to spark a paradigm shift in the language used to describe human diversity by progressives, by the woke, by the enlightening, by the blah, the blah, whoever category you see yourself in. Uh, I'm not speaking to those for whom you cannot change their minds because they have very deep-seated dehumanizing and racist belief. That's not my, that's not my water to carry. I'm trying to have a conversation with those who are trying to advance equity in our society. And uh, I'm willing to speak to all, but I just wanna be very clear of what I'm trying to do in a short, brief period of time. So again, I hope you will join in this transformative and challenging conversation. It's not easy, there's a lot of tentacles to this, uh, but I hope that it would allow us to start to, to move forward from very deeply rooted issue of, of racism and dehumanization. So, I want to begin with some thought work. So I want you to take some time, and we're not going to do this like a full workshop, but I want you to take some time, and I want you to put it either in chat or write it down on notes or whatever you have in front of you. I want you to list the top three ways you categorize people. What are the top three ways you categorize people at your job? Take a second. One, two, three. Don't overthink it. Just say, we categorize people according to this. One, two, three. Okay, so I'm looking at my colleagues who I can see. Then I want you to step back, breathe a little bit, take a good breath, because I do that, and then list the top three ways you categorize people just in general. And it might be the same as, your, as what you have down, or it might not be, but take a second. Put it in chat, write it down on a napkin, whatever you have in front of you, wherever you are Zooming from. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. So I want you to hold on to these. I want you to remember them. Okay. So let me ask my colleagues, uh, since I only have the two I can ask at the moment, any one of you can tell me your top three ways to categorize people at your job. 
I categorized at my job by gender, by position, and by race. All right. Janet, you want to go? The top three ways you categorize people personally. Oh, okay. Um, so what I sort of came up with is whether I feel commonality, whether I find them interesting, or whether I don't find them interesting. Okay, fantastic. I appreciate that. All right, and many of you, you probably doing the same thing. You might have some of the same responses as my colleagues have, and you might not. But I, I, if I was to beg, many, if not all of you, would use the word race as one way that you categorize people at your job and how you categorize people personally, or even categorize yourself personally. I have a young daughter, and she keeps me so, so, so intellectually clear because, again, she's so exact in her language. And I'm hoping today we will have a conversation about how to be more exacting in our language with each other. And, you know, I love Dr. Seuss. I'm back in Dr. Seuss because, again, she's only five. And, and terms like people are people, people are people. It's just so, it's just so simple, but, again, it's so, it's so humanizing. It's so powerful. And, and I learned from her. So she will be coming up over and over again in our talk, uh, an example. But the idea that people are people. We all are humans. But this idea of race we keep using. So we define race, and normally I would ask you to define race, but I think we're not going to have enough time for that. Um, but if you do, take a second to define race for yourself. You know, what is race? What is, just, just bullets, no big pros. Uh, it's definitely not one of those sort of situations. So please take a second. Define race for yourself. Okay? But once you've done that, just jot some bullets down. Let's do one other thought experiment. So I want you to close your eyes. I want you to take three deep breaths. And then I want you to repeat after me and say this three times. I want you to say, my race is, and I want you to say what you would use as your racial classification. So, Ms. Williams and, 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 and Ms. Gallo, would y'all say this? My race is? My race is black. My race is? My race you is say it three times. My race, My race is, is black. Right. My race is black. So st then I want you to think for a second. I might be going a little fast. I operate with the New York culture. I want you to think for a second. I want you to think about how do you feel when you said that? How did you feel about your racial group? Was there any emotional reaction when you say that? And for some, you're looking at the eyes gold, I um, mean the eyes black and green, and that's what that's 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 that color behind Miss Williams and Ms. Gallo. So it's often referred to that eyes means blood, red, black, and green. And it has a lot of meaning uh, to it by those who came out of the um, uh, uh, the movement with Marcus Garvey. Uh, that got, became popularized in the United States and then globally. But anyway, I want you to think about when you said my racial classification, what did that mean? How did you feel? What sort of thoughts did it provoke? Okay. Now, I want you then to, re I want you to think about replacing the word my race, and I want you to say my subspecies is and use the same terms that you used before. So you can say that three times. So my subspecies is black. My subspecies is black. My subspecies is black. Wonderful, thank you. I appreciate again your patience and your engagement with this. I hope all of you who I cannot see that you took the time to do that as well. And I want you now to reflect. How did it make you feel? What did you think about when you used the word subspecies I hate it. Taking and, and Ms. Williams or Janet, you can either say what you felt. What did uh, you think of? Go ahead, Janet. I was just going to say, I felt this is factually incorrect. I mean, that we're all subspecies Homo sapiens sapien, and it just, it's a social construct, and it kind of, it made me mad, and it made me uncomfortable. It makes us all uncomfortable. It makes us all mad. But we didn't feel the same way when we used my race, did we? 
I, I felt separate. I felt different. I, I immediately felt that. But subspecies took me another place that I didn't appreciate. And it takes us all to another place. But here's the interesting thing. Race is a synonym for subspecies. Subspecies is a synonym for race. They mean the same thing. And you should need to you need to know that in order to free yourself from this and this is the things we've learned and the, the science and the history books and things we've been reading in our journal club. It makes it clear. This is not new news, but when you put it into practice, you begin to get a sense of what you have really been talking about and what you really have been doing when you use this sort of language. So Webster defines Cambridge defines pick any dictionary you want pick it up on your iPhone iPad. And for you Android users, the same thing. Find a dictionary. This is about plurality and diversity. If you look at it, it will show you. This is how we define this idea of race. It's about, it's, it's about a grouping, a subspecies. The concept was a scientific concept born out of biology to be able to group living things and try to understand what those groupings are. And then it was applied, as you will see briefly, and I'm going to move through this quickly because this can take a long time for me to get through this material, and I want to be able to engage in dialogue with you, but we have to start here at the foundation that to understand what race means. It means subspecies. Every time you say race, you're talking about your subspecies. That's what the language means, and right now we're having a conversation about language. This is not the whole world, but we say we use language and language matters. It has implications as we'll get to. So this is more than just a conversation about spoken word. This matters. You know it matters. You hear it. Some people will hear a, a, a word that's used to describe them, and it could bring them to anger. It could bring them, again, to action. You saw it in Washington, D.C. not more than a week ago, how language brought people to action, to violence, to commitment, to, to all sorts of thoughts that even threaten our very democracy. So this is not a simple or a, a, neg a conversation that doesn't matter or just esoteric or just an academic thing. No, words matter. Science actually shows us that positive and negative words affects us deeply psychologically and they have a significant impact on our outcomes. Any of you have known this, I remember that uh, I was a young man, uh, as my mother says, steeped in my ways. And I was about 13 years old, and I was sitting in English, and the teachers rolled out a con concept of positive and negative criticism. I was like, where does, where does this language come from? So I went home, and I thought, I, you know, I was like, I'm learning, and I'm engaged, and I said, mother, 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 I, you know, what you're giving me here is negative criticism. Well, she swiftly acknowledged my learning and returned her motherly wisdom to me, you know? And I, that's all I can say about that because it didn't go over well. As much as I learned this concept, my use of the words had an impact. But what it did was allow me to understand those who were pouring into my spirit and those who were not. So I was beginning to understand that words matter. Like it says, words impact us deeply and psychologically, and then they have social value and it impacts our behaviors and our lives, okay? So the, the, the psychologist uh, Maria Richter did experiment around these things and they found that these words have an impact in children. It's found that children who were exposed to negative words and auditory words as spoken had an impact in how they perceive and experience the world and it relieves stress hormones and anxiety inducing hormones in these children. So again, negative words, whether spoken or heard or thought of, are not only situational stress, but also contribute to long-term anxiety and feelings. And they say that it operated through, through something that these uh, uh, neuroscientists call the pain matrix, that that's the pathway, that the pain matrix is, is the brain storage place for past memories of painful experiences as a reminder to avoid painful situations in the future, that the brain retain these memories and experiences and they're triggered. So now the concept of race and how it has been applied in the United States 
and and slavery and the brutal slavery that was and everything that came after that Jim Crow and the and the terrorists that Jim Crow is basically saying what do we what do we think about domestic terrorism against black people for long periods of time that's that's really what Jim Crow was right and uh it has an impact and the word is so is so um ripened with a lot of history race as a language that language that word does not enter the room or in our minds uh clean it enters with all this history it enters with all this bias it enters with all this pain and whether or not it's totally conscious or subconscious it has an impact on us whether or not we're progressive or regressive thinking in how we want to extend um our, our american democracy or republic so it matters quite a bit and I wanted to bring that to your attention again, this section of the brain, these painful memories that are triggered. So I've been spending a lot of time asking, you know, what sort of damage are progressives doing to themselves with the use of race language? Let me give you an example. Racial justice. Racial inequality. It says subspecies justice, subspecies equality. And I'm thinking about this is how we use it. And I'll get to why I find it most troubling, not just the use, but whose victory does it represent? Whose victory that use of language represent? And how we're complicit, I'm guilty. I had decades of science and work as part of that victory, not even unconsciously that I've been taken advantage of. And then what's the implication of the perpetuation of this race language for racism across the generations? These are important things. I don't have the answer to all these things, but my goal is to get it for us to be thinking deeply in our practice as well as in our science. This is not something for the university. It operates directly in your everyday life as a practitioner and just as a human being. So race should not be applied to human beings is my point. Not just because I feel like it, you know, not because I have some higher moral values. It's just because it's scientifically not correct. And I and I hear and I watch and I talk with people who say he'll tell me first, yes, race is a uh, is a social construct, and then the, and then everything they do, we we'll talk about racial justice, not paying attention to the idea of what they're perpetuating and what they're talking about people I admire, people doing good work. But then we say 40 years later, why are we finding as many racist young children in, in, in one group and anti-racist young children in another group? Why does, how does it perpetuate across the generations? Even among people who you can say, you can find to be decent and, and, and in the sense that they have morals and values, but they have a perspective on understanding that you might differ with. So, let me take you through a, quickly on the birth process of a culture of hate, because that's what we're that's what we've been struggling with, a birth process of a culture of hate. So in the 15th century, there was an effort to dehumanize uh, uh, Africans primarily for economic gain, slavery, intercontinental slavery. So prior to this, there were always an idea of those who were higher blood and lower blood, particularly in Europe, for example. They call them nobles and those who are not nobles, those who are ordained by God to lead because they're born in this family and they keep those chains, those bloodlines going. And those are your nobles and those who are not born into it. You can never aspire to it. That's the idea. And at that point in time, when people are only dealing with those right next to them, everyone was look, they look similar. And that's how they they set up these caste systems according to bloodlines and and heritage and right and ancestry not necessarily geographic uh, uh, ancestry but again uh, direct um, hereditary and linkages that gave birth to the idea of race and it, it was really an important tool used by enslavers and colonizers why for economic gain. You need to understand at the same time the, 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 the Christianity, 
Judeo-Christian values were very, very orthodox. The idea of treating people less than how Christ wants you to treat them, as an example, if you take a Christian faith, or even an Islamic faith, the idea that you're treating other human beings less, this principles of treating everyone equal, you know, treat your brother as you would treat yourselves. So in order for them to make this spiritual, religious, because religion organized and determined many things before science. It was religion. And what happened was, is that they couldn't dehumanize or enslave Africans in the way they wanted to, unless they say that they were other. They were not human like us. So thus, our orthodox religious beliefs are not in question. We don't violate that because they're not humans like us. In fact, the thought they want to perpetuate was they were just above animals. So though they might look human, they're not human and they don't even come from our human chain. Like we were both born from different uh, 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 lines, all right? So this was the idea. And then the idea of applying this notion of subspecies uh, of race emerged in the 17th century. Racism and white superiority became the lie and it is enforced with terrorism. And then systemic racism is the idea that's codified into culture and practice. Practice means everything, law, how we live each other, how we treat each other, segregation, all those things. Let me speed this up because I think, uh, yeah, I think I, I'm going to run out of time. So the idea, before I get too far, I want to say <sighs> racism is real. The idea of racializing people and treating them in a certain way is what we call racism. That is real. That's not a construct. That's not made up in our minds. People treat other people based on this idea that they are racialized. And for example, how blacks are treated in the United States, we saw it on full display, as we said, again, uh, with, 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 with the um, insurrection that happened in DC. And we all talk about it, that again, if you really look at it, I, I, I thought it was a difference between, I don't know how those police officers didn't ask, the question didn't come up, why did they feel safe as if their lives weren't threatened versus the young man who was killing uh, uh, in Minnesota who was going into his car and, and he was shot in the back because the officer felt his life was threatened. I was just really curious about that. But anyway, I digress. And if you didn't understand that, we can talk about that a little more. So racism is real. So this is, it began with this classification and I'm not gonna go through all of it. The idea is that there was a great chain of living things and at the top was deity, God, um, the, 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 the divine one and the bottom was the lowest level, which is demons at the bottom, but every little thing, every living thing was ranked. And this was based on religious teachings. So this idea of ranking little living things then moved forward into racial classification. So as we were, as the slave trade was, was, was taking place, the, the perpetuation, the idea that these Africans were not humans, but they're human-like and they're very different, um, that it dominated our thinking. So this orthodox Christian belief was easy for people to give up. And they gave it up before even the founding of America. So again, if you're looking at 16, as this, as this image will show you, as that, as that was happening, it was really motivated just by greed economics drove this and the moral idea of how you treat human beings went to the wayside or was rationalized according to racialized language according to the idea that either the spirit was not a christian spirit and thus they had to be converted but the idea is that they were not humans like the europeans say they were humans their humanity was not one to be questioned because again these are just something that they were trying to codify as being different. As Toni Morrison says in her book, other, the idea of othering um, was what was taking place at this time. And this continued for hundreds of years. So when we arrive here uh, in our modern view of looking at the 20th century and now we're in the 21st century, you gotta understand it took a long time not only for this chattel slavery to continue, but it took a long time for this idea to be woven and sewn into our, in, deeply into our, into our culture, our subconscious, and the way we operate with each other. Whether or not they were, and they're abolitionists, or whether or not they were progressive, 
whether or not you were anti-racist, it just was part of what we were, the language and the platform we used to advance this critical concept of races in, 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 in the United States. I'm gonna move past this. You get the idea. This happened and took a long time. And as, as this is showing, so let me move past that. So uh, I'm gonna jump ahead because I, I can give you the science and the, and the scholars who started this started using you know, these categories and then ascribing personalities and characteristics. Let me get past a lot of this because again, uh, how and when it started, but you get the idea that people started using and science then became part of this apparatus. Racial classification was based on anatomical and cultural characteristics. Um, these were the emergence of the five groups uh, and the invention of the term like Caucasian, which is really interesting because there was a Supreme Court case that really a, a, a South Asian man uh, who would be defined because he was from the Caucasus Mountains couldn't even be defined as being white because the, 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 the effort to dehumanize him because of his skin color. People couldn't even, they couldn't even accept their own definition of what Caucasian was. And that went all the way up to the United Supreme Court who says, no, he's not white because white was defined as being from Caucasoid mountains and all these things. So there's a lot of rich history here, folks. And I bring this up for, the re for these sort of reasons so we can get into it. So uh, all humans are of one species. We don't have any subspecies. So that's biologically, there are no races when you look at human beings. That's what the science tells us, and that is consistent. Racism in America has an impact. It, it has an impact, its beliefs, its attitudes, its institutional arrangements, and we tend to, to treat each other or denigrate groups based on phenotypic characteristics and ethnic group affiliation. Um, this has been going on, for a going on for a long time and it impacts stress. It impacts hypertension and anxiety and preterm uh, pre and low birth weight outcomes, obsessive compulsive disorder, increased depression, poor academic performance. Racism has an impact on us. So, and individuals versus institutional or structural racism, many talk about that. And these are the language that they use. And again, we know um, discrimination matters. Uh, discrimination is just a way to get more specific about how racism operates. Um, and there's a lot of examples of that. I'm gonna to try to move past a lot of this because again, um, it impacts residential segregation and it, it, it puts people in context and enforces that context to say, you cannot move. You can only have this quality of schools. These are the economic opportunities that are available for you. All of this is centered, grouped and organized around this idea of race and what, do, and what it means to be of a certain race or class. And, uh, and all these things have an impact on us. The quality of schools, the air we breathe, the jobs we have, again, so, this is not just about spoken word. That's my point. And it has an impact on us. I want to get out of some of this uh, examples to get to the, the meat of what I want to um, see if we can have this conversation. It impacts on boys and young men. That's work that I do. Creates inequality. Um, over and over again, I just feel that I had to spend a lot of time talking with you about its impact. Here's what... I'm most concerned about. Our use of race comes out of a very strategic and intentional effort by scientists at the turn of the century to advance what we call scientific racism. And it, and it, it dovetails with the rise of what we call racial statistics. Again, the statistic to describe variation in races, though the science tells us there's only one human species. And this was done at the highest level. This is not small. This is the American Statistical Association, the National Institutes of Health, foundations. Everyone was complicit in this. And the idea is coming out of slavery. Um, this was an effort to, again, move the kind of Jim Crow uh, uh, process that, that Jim Crow in America in the way that we experienced it. So the idea was without slavery, blacks would become extinct. That was the, that was the idea of this group of individuals. You know that genetic deficiencies rendered blacks unsuitable, listen, this is quotes, this is now, unsuitable for survival in an industrial society. Unsuitable for survival. And that no justifiable government policy could alter their unsuitability for survival in the society. These are leading scientists and thought leaders of the time. 
So human diversity statistics are not inherently bad. We use them as useful tools to understand how groups are experiencing, what's happening to them, who's most at risk. What do we, so we use demographic statistics, but what we've been doing is then we've been a victim of a media campaign and a campaign to use it and describe it as if it's races with scientific validity. And one of the architects of this, what is one of the architects, Sir Francis um, Galton, again, a uh, cousin of, 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 of Darwin, no more than there's equality between man and man of the same nation is there equality between race and race. Again, perpetuating this idea very clearly. But the movement was called eugenics. Eugene meaning well-born of good stock of noble race. And the, the annex of that is the science, the study of factors capable of improving the physiological and intellectual status of populations that affects the conditions of human product, reproduction and physical environment. So the idea, eugenics, is the study of how to create more well-born. And eugenicists just wanted the well-born. Now remember, I told you about the previous slide, because the survival of the degenerate races is antithetical to the society. Not their presence. I keep I'm a little passionate, folks. Their survival. So these eugenicists perpetuate these ideas and put them into policy. This is in the United States, eugenics buildings. They did this with many groups, sterilizing women, sterilizing. So the idea when you think about lynching and why, what was the fascination in lynching with black male body parts? Why did they tend to cut it off? Again, this was the propaganda promoted by the Pioneer Fund, the National Science Council, uh, wealthy people like Charles Davenport. These are people at the turn of the century that really pushed this into American culture, but also into American policy. Steeped on this idea that there are races and then some races are more deficient and they should not be able to intermix with the higher, more noble races. So we got to get rid of them or we got to limit them or keep them from having babies. So again, the principles of eugenesis is that the unchangeable biological basis of race, that who you are is who you are. And there are those who are noble and those who are less noble. Hereditary is the basis on which things that determines your physical, mental, moral, and behavioral characteristics. We call that biological determinism. And biological evolution and the superiority of the human race, of the European race, white supremacy is what matters. So when you listen to a lot of the, some of the individuals who are in DC and in other groups, you hear this idea of white superiority and the idea of return our nation, take it back to its greatness and in, in the founding of the country. All right, I don't need to say more about that. So these groups continue, they have good practice. So what am I encouraging you to do? It's not just I want a moratorium on the use of race for describing, for describing human difference. That's part of what I want you to do. I want you to seriously consider how this happens in everyday life. I want you to consider in your social movement to try to bring about progress and, and equity and equality in our society, how we're using practices that, that brings back and gives eugenesis a win. What I, why I keep calling it a win. Eugenesis could not prove in all their science that there were subspecies of human beings. Even with the emergence of the human genome, which is a more modern thing. Now we get, you know, everybody 23 and me, you know, the human genome still confirms there's more similarities between Janet Gillow and myself than probably between Ms. Williams and myself. That this idea of race is, is, is really a cultural weapon used to perpetuate dehumanization the idea of white privilege and violence. Now, I'm not saying this is why you use the word race. You use it because you've been trained to use it. 
I'm not saying that we can't understand the word race. We just got to know what it means. So let me say a couple of things to be helpful here. We have social identities that matter to us, not only because of what we believe in it, but how others treat us. So I'm encouraging you to understand that if you believe and you understand and the evidence is pretty clear, this is not, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time, that race, subspecies among human beings don't exist, then don't fall for the trap talking about it's a social construct and that's what it is. Don't fall for that. Because all they're doing is shifting the burden of proof or evidence to say that they're subgroups. Let me, let me tell you what I mean. So you treat, you, you, you keep blacks, in, and using blacks as the example, blacks in the United States in, in a very specific caste system, right? And then you, you, don't, you tell them that if they want to learn, they will be killed for centuries. Then they show you not only the capacity to learn, but they, they can learn better, because this is how the divine created us, better than some whites, right? So that breaks that myth. But the main point is, then you put them in, in, and then you do analysis to say, why are blacks performing poorer on, on examinations that were designed for those who've been taught to read? You know, why do they speak that way after centuries of telling them they, they only could speak that way? So basically, it's, 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 you know, people have designed this so that they'll find exactly what they constructed. And then tells us, well, no longer are we using biological science to examine this. Let's use social constructs and the experiences to define race. So don't fall for that trap. Don't fall for that. They're still believing the same thing and perpetuating the same lie. That there are races and then there are natural differences between those races. So what do you do? You be more exact. We have excellent science and scholarship that tells us that if we want to describe differences among us as human beings, we have culture, we have ancestry, we have geography, we have behavior. But those things are more appropriately described as ethnicity. Ethnicity, not subspecies. They're ethnic groups, social identities. And that can go on, I have many social identities. But when I'm describing it, I can describe it specifically my ethnic identity or my ancestry my my family's you know I, I do think and this is my own humor but please accept it you know i do think brooklyn is its own planet in the united states and the world so i do always say you know i have my brooklyn identity i love my st louis and where i'm at but again and geography and my caribbean heritage so there's a lot of layers to me but those things could be described scientifically and socially and even in a practice level as our ethnicity. And don't do the cop out. Race slash ethnicity. Race slash ethnicity. Why are you holding on to this eugenicist propaganda? We can study how people are racialized, meaningful. We can study how racism impact people, meaningful, right? But you're not studying race unless you're trying to prove that there are subspecies of human beings. You're not describing which groups has access to care when you use race. The term you should be using is ethnicity. If you want to look at that human variation of who came in and the, and the constructs like black people, white people, if you identify with that, that's fine. Asian American, Italian American, all those, again, use them. I'm not, that works, but it's not about race. It's not racial classification. It's ethnic classification. Because if you go down to say it's racial classification, you're giving eugenicists the win that they could not prove with science and that they advance with culture. Wonderful book in our last journal club, we closed, we closed that out, is Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. And Wilkinson gives us at least, again, she brings to the fore, not like nobody's talked about it, but she's really taking it to the next level to say that, well, what is the system that we have set up? It's a caste system, a means of assigning value to people that guides us beyond the reaches of our awareness, 
It's an unconscious ranking of people. So there's an American caste system that was set up. Caste means that you rank people according to physical characteristics, and then you enforce that ranking. That's what happened in America. We were ranked according to our skin color and then physical characteristics. And then Jim Crow era represents the violence, the enforcement of those rules, of those rankings. The concept of stay in your place is what caste is about. So if you really want to talk about America, you talk about American caste system. If you really want to talk about America, you talk about American violence. And then if you want to then Com use compound language, racism represents the caste and the violence and the effort to keep people in their place. So I'm just saying be more exact in your language as you're thinking about this, you know? And then Wilkinson points out, and again, there's many books to support this, a lot of scholarship to support this. Again, uh, we can do better, right? That in America, the signal for caste is, is what we call skin color or what we have often been referring to as race. So the biggest indicator of whether or not you are in a group that we used to call race was skin color. And I've, I, you know, again, and if you were able to be of African descent and pass for white, it messed up the whole game. You didn't know who was who. So the idea is that skin color is the primary tool, the visible decoy that represents how our caste system is structured. So Wilkinson says, caste is the bones and race is the physical traits, right? Race is the skin of, of, of our system. Caste is the bones. So the more specific we can be in language, the better we can engage in anti-racist practices. And we have to move beyond this language. Like I love this, I was looking at my invitation today and I was like, oh, there it goes all again. And I, I, this is what I was saying, Ms. Williams, I'm just using it because again, we're all in this, right? So it, it was a wonderful invitation that says, you know, we're at this time marked by convergence of a new movement for racial justice. That means certain races, subspecies are not getting justice. You see how we're caught up in it? You see how it, it, it flows into our everyday language, right? Or given your leadership that says your commitment to social justice, which I am, racial equity, I'm not committed to saying that there's one race of human beings and there's another one that need to be equal. I'm not in the racial equity business, I'm in the equity business. And there's difference between different uh, ethnic groups, different geographies, and we can speak to clearly about equity, but it's not racial equity to say that I am now a different race and less value, and I wanna be equal. It's not your race, okay? And I want us to kind of move past that. Because when I hear this language, again, I'll go back and look at my own writings. I understand why we're here. But I'm saying we can do better in the 21st century. We could take this to another level. And it's not just because it's good moral practice, it's sound scientific practice. Because the evidence is there. I ask my students now, if you want to measure humanity, how many subspecies do, do we have? And if they start telling me, if they go beyond a dichotomous, sorry for, you know, zeros and one, I was like, I've lost the battle. If they started saying there's white, black, I'm, it's over. Because there is only human, non-human. That's how many subspecies we have. We don't, we don't have any, just one. So if you want to describe people by ethnicity, that's different. If you want to describe them by culture, behavior, other characteristics, be specific. But it's not race. Because the consequence of advancing genetics, I, genetics, eugenesis ideas is all around you, whether it's conscious or subconscious. And we see it. Physical characteristics of black, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, black people, any black male who's incarcerated the research shows that his physical cat, the more black he looked, the, the more severe his sentences was. In our schools, black children attend, particularly black males attend to be treated as a group. Whites attend to be treated as individuals. As much as you see what happened in DC, 
they're going to individualize many people. When the Black Lives Movement, which consisted of a vast, diverse group of Americans, they treat them as a group. But when you're hearing in DC, you're hearing individual level things. You're not hearing that this was the Republican movement. You're not hearing that. But you hear black lives, they, they treat them as groups. So it has implications, it has impact on us. I need to stop, because I'm going too far. And, uh, and my point is, is that we can do better and we can set new standards for practice and it impacts how we see things. Basically, people, I'm asking you to free your mind. Free your mind and you can still collect data to understand vulnerability in our society. It's ethnic data, right? It's demogra ethnicity is a part of the demographic tools that we have, right? But this is hard to unwrap because the consequences are, are huge. This language is codified in our laws and we don't wanna make ourselves more vulnerable and to think that racism doesn't matter. Racism matters, but race is not real. So use the more exact language in your practice. And I'll stop there. Dr. Joe, I never thought you would be able to win me over in this conversation about the use of the word race, but I think you've made some headway with me. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. That's saying quite a lot. Uh, we have the most reflections and questions that I've ever seen in the chat since I've been co-moderating. A big thank you to you from the audience and from Janet and myself. Thank you so much. One of the questions that we have is, um, oh, Kimberly Wine says, this is one of the best webinars I have ever attended. And you're getting a lot of applause. Oh, so you. here's the question. If one is just beginning their journey in becoming an anti-racist or equitist, what book would you recommend to start their education? Wow. You know what? Um, can you guys see this? Start, start here. This the is by Origins Tony, of Others. Okay. The Origins of Others by Toni Morrison. It's a wonderful brief set of essays that she gave uh, on the topic. If you want to take a, a, or read Wilkerson's book, I think the book on cast is thick, but it's good. It's well done. Uh, there are many others. If you want to interrogate this from as a scientist, there's others that I would recommend. But I think start with Toni Morrison's book. There's a comment. I'm going back to the top, closer to the top from Michael M. He says race. He says I like that race equals eugenesis propaganda. Fantastic. Did he capture what you were saying, Dr. Joe? In some respect it's a eugenicist victory yes okay all right so we got a yes um we have an endorsement of the tony morrison book another person asked the comment was the information provided is so deep i'm going to be dwelling on it for some time to come another question or oh, comment Dr. Joe, I could spend so much more time with Dr. Joe learning from him. So I'm moving back up to the top. Sure. Okay. One of the questions has to do with how do we go about, oh, Renita Jones said that explains the reason the U.S. only applies a checkbox for ethnicities to people who are Latinx, but other countries that are visually more similar talk about their population in terms of ethnicities. Do you have a comment? You agree? No, I think they're right. I mean, this is practical things that we can change. We can change it. Now, I know for some of you, particularly if you're in agencies or you, or you have reporting requirements, yeah, but you can, you can start engaging in anti-racist practice every day in terms of how you describe yourself, how you create a form, how you collect information, how you describe groupings of individuals. You can start engaging in that immediately. You don't need an act of Congress to do it. So you've answered the question from Melody, I think. So many application forms ask the question, race and or ethnicity. How do we impact the removal of the question from these forms? I often select other or NA as a form of protest. 
So it's really up to those who create the forms. And I think you you indicating that, that you have concerns about that. But for a lot of you, you're in a position to, to also create new forms. You do that every day, or we accept it. And I think you're starting to see some progress where there are others who are saying, yeah, we can collect this information. But the, the real meaning here is that you, or the idea here is that we have to start referring or using the language of race because the way we got it into American culture is because scientists could not, eugenicist scientists could not prove it empirically and scientifically. So they did a campaign for us to adopt it. And, and, and then the history, and there's a lot of psychological reasons why, even all whites adopted it because in slavery, one of the things that's interesting, if you weren't wealthy and you were just, you know, just regular white in the United States, their economic situation was not that far different from blacks, but the only thing they cling to was that at least they're, they're not subjugated into the caste of being the lowest in the wrong, which means to be black. And they were able to exact, exact violence on blacks. So they felt a little superior, though economically, they were in the same place. They looked, the, the clothes looked the same, the food access was the same. And for some, some slaves were better off because they, they had to get food. And my point to you is, is that this is all a major victory for eugenicists in how we use it. And then again, because we thought we had no better tools. Ethnicities is a more exact term. Dr. Joe, there's a, a, a consensus that individuals would like to have your contact information. May we share that? Uh, yes, ma'am. And you know what you want to share. I appreciate that. Okay. And they would also like to know, may we post your slides on our webpage? Now, this is all developing work, folks. So I can't post it yet. Okay. So I want to make sure we can get it out. Thank you so much. Okay. Lillian says, great. We great renewing the mind for my family and community change. I'm not defined as a race, but a human. I no longer will identify as black. This is my next topic for my family virtual Zoom meeting. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. You well, let me say are, this though, okay. Ms. Williams, on that comment, because again, I have no problem with the concept of black people. I just know that what I'm talking about is, is not my race, but my ethnic identification. That means a lot to me. So Lillian, I would encourage you that give thought to that. You can make that choice. You don't have to give this up. No group has to give up uh, Latino, uh, Puerto Rican, uh, Mexican, Guatemalan, uh, uh, Lotion, no, Chinese. I'm not saying to give up any of that. I'm just saying to make sure that you clarify and free your mind that you're not talking about and don't respond to the idea of your race because it's not race. Don't respond to the idea because what it does, again, it allows for intergenerational perpetuation of this notion of white supremacy because it's codified and it's, it's pervasive in our culture that we're thinking, well, this is a racial, the status of racial relations in the United States. It's not racial relations. See, Dr. We, you listen to it. Go ahead, Ms. Williams. Dr. Joe, please write a book or do you have one already? No, it's, it's, it's what... As Ms. Williams know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And hopefully there's a sabbatical coming up in my future. You know, I'll talk to my dean so I can get this done. Dr. Joe, you are closely connected to the Race and Opportunity Lab. Would you please explain the title of your lab? Excellent question. Again, as I said in the front end of this talk, I chose that name because the construct of race was so pervasive. That's why I started studying it. And I, and I know it interacts with opportunity structures or our caste system. So I am, as a scientist, studying how do you advance equality in our society by beginning by looking at race, as we talk about it, and uh, opportunity. So I wouldn't have gotten here if I didn't know I needed to focus on what does that thing mean? And how does it then relate to opportunity, particularly for black males in the United States? So that's why we study this. We are a journal club. We, we look at this material very deeply. And that, what you're hearing is, is, is years of spending time in this material. Dr. Joe, we are at our final, we're past our final minute. I'd like to ask you what last thoughts would you like to leave with the audience? Uh, first of all, I say continue, you know, the, the people use words and my, one of my powerful words for this year is love. Continue to act for, in, in love for humanity, to know that we have to figure this world out together 
and, and, and to pay attention to ways that you might dehumanize other people with your language and in your practice. And more important, this is not gonna, this is not something that happens overnight. Give it as great thought as you can, free your mind where you can, and respect those who are still in the struggle and, and to treat them in, in the ways that you would wanna be treated because we're all learning and we're all trying to make this place a better democracy and a little more equal and a little more humane. So with that, I say, thank you for listening and, and, and for being here. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Jan, Janet's gonna take us out. Dr. Joe, thank you so much um, for challenging important thoughts. I think all of us uh, have been left with a lot to process, but um, just a privilege to be a part of this. I really wanna thank the audience for their generosity with their questions, their comments for, for leaning into this. And um, as always to my co-host, Cynthia, thank you so much you, um, for being my partner in these programs. Um, so to everyone, the recording of this will be available on our YouTube channel in a couple hours. I appreciate you being a part of it and hope to see you again um, on a future Open Classroom. We've got some great things coming up for you. Goodbye now. Bye, Dr. Joe. Thank you.